Okay, we are live. Uh, this is Pesci's Recovery Corner. We are a recovery podcast. We talk about all things recovery from all forms of life. When I say recovery, we're talking about drug addiction. Uh, we talk about alcoholism and mental health. There are um, many guests that come on here that have a recovery story, a recovery path. Um, today, I have a very special friend. He's over on the East Coast in New York. Um, his name is Joe Ortiz. Welcome to the corner. Thanks, Peggy. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Um, so, you know, usually this is the way this works. And I'm going to have somebody that actually is going to walk past, back, past here because of our technical difficulties that we have. But this is actually, we're still running live. We want to hear about you, Joe. First of all, this is, Joe and I are both interventionists. We work on both coasts. I'm in LA, Orange County. He's out in New York. Um, I I'm think actually in New Jersey, but right next New to Jersey. New Jersey. Okay, New Jersey, New York, right there. Um, so I think that we may have met because we're both major Prince fans. Um, <laughs> but then later on, we come to find that we were both in recovery too. And so uh, he was working at RCA, I believe, a few years ago. I was working at Delphi, which was East Coast based. And then we just struck up a conversation, got to know each other, and we're – we're very much in each other's lives. We're, we're, we're friends now. We've never met in person, but we're never very good person. friends. But um, so usually the way it works is we want to delve into your past. Joe, who are you? Where were you born? Where were you raised? We'll get into the, the nitty gritty, the, the drug use or the alcohol use or both. And then after that, we'll get into the recovery. Tell, tell us about yourself. Sure, sure. sure. And I just want to just one slight correction. I actually reached out to you. I was networking, right? I was trying to find, you know, referral sources and we we connected and then i found out what a big prince fan you were and then i told you what a big prince fan i was and that's where we really connected right that and being brothers in recovery right yeah so yes. um yeah i uh i was born in perth amboy new jersey um it's an urban city uh very uh latino urban city and uh my parents are both originally from Puerto Rico. <clears throat> uh, my brother, my sister, and I are born and raised here. And um, yeah, you know, I grew up in the 70s in Perth Amboy. It was kind of a rough neighborhood. Uh, I was not a tough dude. I was uh, very much the nerd, you know, and uh, the nice kid, really. Uh, that changed later. Um, let me shut that off. I'm sorry about that. I meant to silence that. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm originally from. I am the oldest of three. I have a brother who's four years younger than me. I'm 54 now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my brother's what, 51, and my sister is 45. So it's three of us. Yeah. And, uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm listening to you. Okay. So, I know, did, you, did you want me to keep keep going? I'm sorry. So tell me, growing up in in that area, you said in Jersey, is that where you guys grew up? Yeah, yeah. It's central New Jersey, Perth Amboy, my hometown. I no longer live there. I've moved, I moved out in 2003. I live in Old Bridge, New Jersey now. And uh, what was it like? I mean, it was a little rough, you know. Um, I lived next to the projects. I didn't live in the projects, but I lived next to what was called the Stockton Building at the time. And, I was a pretty, I was only a block away from there. So there was a lot going on there, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, the 70s, there was a lot of crime in the 70s. Um, mm -hmm. For Thamboy, didn't really get cleaned up or, I mean, for lack of a better term, you know, it just, they turned things around as far as crime uh, back in the 80s uh, mm -hmm. and the early 90s. So, um, yeah, but I mean, look, I was always like, like I said, a nice kid. I, I tried to mind my own business. Um, I was always in like, you know, the accelerated classes with the other nerds, you know, so that was cool. Right, um, right. I have a lot of friends still to this day that I went to school with my whole life. Um, I, you know, I will tell you that being kind of, you know, again, not to overuse the word nerd, but just a shy kind of guy um, and uh, not really a troublemaker. Uh, it was, it was kind of tough growing up there because, you know, I'd get picked on, you know, um, and uh, it was just a tough neighborhood. So, so let so me ask you a question. Since we're about the same age, I mean, you're 54, I'm going to be 51 tomorrow. 
But oh, nice! Remember, remember when the movie Revenge of the Nerds came out? Came out? Did you when you saw that? Did you think like how you fit right? Like you understand them? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they were like nerds on a whole nerdy, other level. Yeah, that, that was like extreme. Uh, so yeah, no, I did not speak through my nose and laugh like eh, you know. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I will tell you this, Pej, that. Not just because I was in a rough neighborhood, um, just because of other childhood things that went on. I, I always had fear. There was mm -hmm. always fear in here. You know, I always remembered that. Mm -hmm. Not every day, not every second or minute of every day, but it was definitely there on a regular or consistent basis. And that that is just one of the common things that, you know, transcended into my adult life. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, alcohol and then drugs helped me with. Right to cover that fear and give me those beer muscles and the confidence with the ladies and all that. And how old were you when when it started to move into that direction with substances? So, um, you know, I when I was like 16, I, I, I tried weed once and I didn't really like it. I never did uh -huh. like it. You know, it made me really paranoid. Um, but I was introduced to alcohol uh, and. Uh, I guess I was around 18 when I tried my first drink. Um, but before I turned 19, uh, a relative of mine, a cousin of mine, uh, she introduced me to Coke. And how old? How old were you then? I was 18. Okay. I was 18, yeah. And that didn't become a uh, like a love affair right off the bat, but I remember, you know, like immediately just being drawn to it. You know, like I, I, I guess I just liked the way it took me out of me, you know, and... Uh, you know, I would pursue it here and there um, over the next few years. Um, and then I would say in my mid-20s, you, you know what? And I wouldn't strongly pursue it because I remember liking it so much when I first did it. And I kind of realized in myself, within myself, that I need to stay away from this stuff. You know what I mean? Like that was too, like I was too drawn from it. It was too, too powerful of a draw, if you will. And so I, I kind of avoided it. Not that I wouldn't think about it, but I would avoid it. And I just kind of stuck to the drinking, you know. And, um, you know, initially, I, I wouldn't say that, um, although I had instances where I drank alcoholically, um, as a younger man, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, um, I would honestly say that, you know, I had fun with it. You know, mm -hmm. it was fun for a time. And it became my friend slowly. Little by slowly, as we say in recovery circles, um, or at least down here. And uh, yeah, so I will tell you that as soon as I started using alcohol or any other substance, which again was primarily coke, um, I did like what it did for me in regards to masking that fear that I seem to always had um, growing up and taking the anxiety away and uh, and the nervousness away and, and, and making me into a, a more confident, you know, young man, if you will. This is in your early 20s, are you saying? Early, like early to mid 20s and even like, I mean, by the time I was 30, I knew in my heart that I was, I, I used to like to call myself a functioning alcoholic, you know? Um, I remember one day my brother, got in the car with me, my car, and he saw airplane bottles on the floor and they were empty. And he's like, oh, my brother, he's like, you really are an alcoholic. And I corrected him. I said, I prefer highly functional alcoholic. Thank you very much. You know, as if, you know, I was trying to be funny, I guess. But I, I just wanted to back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were childhood traumas, you know, and, and you know, I, I have said a couple of times right now that, you know, the fear was always there. Actually, I kind of remember when the fear came in, you know, um, there's a direct correlation as a boy, as a, a young boy, seven, eight years old, um, where fear set in. And that was when I experienced my first trauma. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and, and I'm an open book, you know, I, I'll tell you that it's sexual in nature at the hands of an adult, you know, and I was seven. You know? And mm -hmm. that's where I remember after that, things changed for me. And, um, 
you know, that was one big event in my life that would drive my behavior for a long time. Right. I, uh, that, and then the other thing was, um, I don't know that I want to get too into it, but it was, it was traumatic enough, let's just say, you know, um, and, uh, both those things would drive my behavior for a long time. I, I used to, it owned me, you know, I can honestly say that those two things, um, really owned me and, and were things that I was trying to escape from for a long time, hence the alcohol and the drugs. And um, it worked for a time, you know, Pez? Yes. It worked for a time. Okay. As, as we often hear, it worked until it didn't work anymore. So in, in your young adulthood, in your early 20s, when it, when it seemed to be working, um, right. how long did this last for? I mean, were you going to – college were you in a relationship or were you just young and carefree and just having a fun time with it yeah um i was trying to do all of the above um i you know i was studying to become a respiratory therapist that's that was my first career um and uh and uh chasing women you know because that's kind of what i was taught to do uh, it's a very latino thing um, I was going to ask you, being, being Latino, I, I didn't even know that you were Puerto Rican, but in, in your area there growing up, uh, was were the neighborhoods segregated by uh, by race or by nationality? Was it were, the, were you growing up in a Puerto Rican area or were you in, in a melted melting pot amongst others from all um, different nationalities? I, I would say that... Um, you know, as far as the segregated question, there were definitely little parts of Perth Amboy that were like more like Polish, uh, Hungarian, which, you know, Perth Amboy originally was very Hungarian, very Polish, very European until the Puerto Ricans got here. You know, the whole West Side Story thing started to happen, right? And um, so by the time I was a kid, there were a lot of Puerto Ricans um, and then like a handful of Dominican and, and uh, other like South American, Mexican, uh, but there were still pockets of Polish and Hungarian, and, and there were black people. They're definitely uh, an urban city. So there was, you know, honestly, like I always say, uh, I'm really grateful for my urban upbringing, you know, because I was exposed to everybody, black, white, Latino, um, you know, all kinds of people. And, and I love that. I love that. You know, right. like I love my friends. I love all my friends. And they're, they're all different colors and races. And I don't know. Maybe just like just like Prince, like Prince said, black, white, Puerto Rican, everybody, just a freaking exactly. good exactly. times. We're rolling, and there you were, <laughs> right, right up in the That's Puerto right. Rican. Oh, they, they sure were rolling. Yeah. You, so I didn't that, even know you. I didn't know you were Puerto Rican until today. And, wow, and really? I should have. I always wondered with a last name like Ortiz. That's definitely Latino. So this is good to know. Okay. Now, yeah. okay. So when, later on. Um, you said you were trying to do relationships. You were chasing women. Definitely, cocaine and alcohol go hand in hand. You're already, uh, you know. Yeah, they do. They're, they're, they are everything that you're describing reminds me of my times from eight, seven, sixteen, all the uh -huh. way up into like, you know, mid to late twenties. Um, that was just the way of life. That was that was the eighties and the nineties. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know. Um, among, you know, in my community, you know, uh, amongst my friends, you know, freestyle was huge, right? Freestyle music. And, um, you know, it was a very big deal to get together with the boys on a Saturday and, you know, do some, uh, what do you call it? Pre-gaming, if you will. You know, we'd meet at Lewis's house or at Tony's house and, you know, we'd all be drinking. And, you know, at the time I did have hair and I'd be checking on my hair and, you know, checking on my outfit and getting ready to go. And, uh and I go clubbing, you know? So yeah, it was all of the above, you know, because I was trying to get ahead in my career. I was having relationships here and there, but I wasn't very good at it. Um, I, I, I wanted to have the relationship and still do what I wanted to do in regards to other things, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, but partying really became a very important thing for me, you know? Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, it all it all boils down to the fact that I was just looking to 
use, you know, drink and use and, and just, I guess, have as much fun as possible. Um, and along the way, there were scrapes, there were problems. Uh, nothing got too out of hand or, or there weren't serious repercussions until I, I got into my early 30s. Um, in 2003, I, I married um, the only girl I've ever wanted to marry in my life, really. You know, I, I had never, ever really, I had been engaged once, but I knew deep down inside that I, I didn't really want to marry her. Um, so I ended up breaking it off. And um, I met my now ex-wife. Um, and uh, yeah, we fell in love. And um, I proposed and I married her in 2003. December, I'm sorry, July of 2003. In December of 2003, we bought our home. And by March of 2004, uh, she was attending al -Anon and asking me to go to therapy. Um, she always said that something happened that December. We got married in July, went on this awesome honeymoon, worked on buying the house, bought the house. And she said that something happened around that time that my drinking and my drugging took a turn for the worse. And all I can say about that is that she's right. That's How old were you right then? About what, what age were you? Um, let's see. That was 2003 and it's 22. So what, about 34, mm -hmm. 35, maybe 35. And um, I just remember, you know, you know how we talk about that big ego with the inferiority complex? That's right. Right. And, uh, and I definitely had that going on. And uh, I do remember after having my very first Christmas party in my, in my new home, um, everybody brought liquor because everybody knew what to give Joe for Christmas, right? Bottles. There were bottles everywhere. <clears throat> and everybody left. And I remember just continuing to sip on whatever drink I was having and looking around and feeling like I had made it. You know, I had arrived. I had the house, I had the pretty little wife, you know. I was already a dad though by then. I have four kids all together actually. Um, I have older kids, adult kids, and then I have my teenager and my 12 year old. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But I did take a turn. You know, I, I, I just, be, I, I, I remember feeling more entitled, you know, and that just kind of emboldened me or maybe, um, Two more gas on the fire of my addiction that was already escalating. And um, so she was attending Al Anon in, in the spring of 2004. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always say she acquired her Al Anon black belt and kicked my ass into the rooms of AA. Right. She definitely learned the part, uh, the parts about boundaries and. Uh, consequences she really liked that one um and detachment she definitely learned those you know but you and i as interventionists interventionists know that yes those things often need to happen but you do them with a lot of love right yes at least that's what i that's what i teach you do them mm -hmm. with a lot of love you do them with purpose and you do them with you know effectiveness or, or to achieve effectiveness and and create an impact or an influence um, and, and listen, I'm not, I own my side of things and I'm not judging my ex-wife because the truth of the matter is she did not know what she did not know. Mm -hmm. right? She didn't know really about the disease of alcohol. She didn't know why I needed it. You know, she didn't know what, you know, why I behaved the way that I did. She also didn't know why the things that she was being told to do weren't working. You know? So that's a tough situation to be in. And you and I see it. We see both sides of it now. So anyway, I started attending AA, and uh, that started a nine-year odyssey of me in and out of the rooms of AA. Um, I put together a year once. One time I put together nine months, six months. And um, eventually, though, I would relapse and pull the rug from underneath us all. And, and when I say underneath us all, now, now we're talking my wife and my son and my daughter who were babies at the time. Um, so that went on for a time. And in uh, December of 2012, she had me removed from my home via a restraining order. Um, from your home? 
from my home via a restraining order. I never, um, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that I never, ever physically harmed her, but she said that I did. But today I understand why she did that. Yeah. I understand why she did that. I didn't physically harm her, but I was harming her, you know, and I was hurting her. And the fact of the matter is, is whether I like her character defects or not, she tried for nine years to help me, you know, or to at least hold our family together, you know, and I have to acknowledge that, you know, um, and she was protecting our kids. She was protecting, I was around my kids, intoxicated, high, you know, you know, bags, like being found here and there, you know, not safe. So I get it. Um, removed December 2012, I did not see my kids at Christmas. And if you ask anyone who knows me, I adore my children. My children are my life, you know. You know how we always say in the rooms of AA, you know, our primary purpose is to stay sober and help another alcoholic. Yeah, but honestly, my children are my, they're my purpose in this life. I, I fully believe that God, my, my father in heaven, put me on this earth to raise my four children, you know, and I praise him, you know, and I'm so grateful that I was able to finally get sober and that I can truly be a real father, you know, the father that I always wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So um, in January of 2013, she filed for divorce, um, which crushed me because as I mentioned to you before, she's the only girl I ever wanted to marry, even mm -hmm. to this day, you know? Don't get me wrong, I'm not still hung up. I love her as the mother of my children. We really aren't compatible. I know that now after nine years of sobriety and growth and, and learning about me, you know, we're not. You know, but we have two beautiful children together, and I think that we do our best to to co-parent. So she filed for divorce. Um, <clears throat> that was really crushing. Like it literally crushed my soul because uh, I loved her, you know. And I also, as I just said, love my children like immensely, and uh, they were being taken away from me, you know, not from her, from. They were being taken away from me by alcohol and drugs, you know. And yes, her. But again, I always have to come back to my side of things, right? She didn't want that for us. And by the way, I wasn't the only one in pain. I recognize today that she was in a lot of pain too. She didn't want that for us. Right. So um, I entered into the deepest depression of my life. I, I've never, I don't ever want to go there again, Pesh. I don't ever want to go there. I, uh, it was so dark. That winter of 2013 was so dark for me. It was so painful. Um, I became suicidal. I can honestly say that I was truly suicidal. Um, and uh, one night, I was contemplating it more than any other night during those months. Right now, now the now the divorce is it, that's in motion supervised visits. I can only see my kids supervised. I'm trying to put the, the plug in the jug, but I still can't. I'm struggling with that. I'm barely employable. I have my life possessions in two big, you know, those, those contractor bags. Mm -hmm. And I move into an apartment with a mattress on the floor, literally a mattress on the floor. My sister-in-law was kind enough. She had a brand new small TV. She gave that to me. I love that woman. <laughs> she, I, I never knew my sister-in-law was going to be one of my best friends. I, I adore her. Um, so there I was, you know, and um, I remember looking up at my children's picture and just breaking down and, and saying to myself, how could I do that to them? You know, they've already been through so much, you know, at their, you know, especially my little ones at their young lives. They had no idea what was happening. You know, my, my son at the time, he was six, he got this skinny because he had no idea what was going on, but he knew daddy wasn't in the house anymore and mommy and daddy weren't talking and his, his little life got turned upside down. So I said to myself, how, you know, how could I do that? And shortly after, um, I always say my Abby Thatcher called me out of nowhere, out of nowhere. His name is Abel. 
I he was an old drinking or using buddy? No, he was he was someone I had sobered up with for a time. Oh. And we would go to meetings together, you know, and uh, but then we both relapsed and we lost touch, you know. But we shared the same sponsor, you know. We still to this day, uh, to this day, share the, uh, share the same sponsor. And uh, Abel calls me up and he's like, "How you doing, man?" You know, and I'm like, "I'm not good, man. I'm not good." You know, it's like, "That's right, bro. Why don't we start going to meetings again like we used to?" You know, and I started to present like, you know, like, "Hey, hey you know, I did that for nine years. It doesn't work. Like, come on, man." You and I sobered up for a time together, you know. It's like, let's do this. You can do this, you know. At that time, that day he called me, he had been two weeks sober. And he had asked our sponsor about me. And our sponsor told him how badly I was doing. So we start going to meetings. This was in spring of 2013, like late spring. And uh, Abel... um, I always say that Abel was the hand of God that pulled me back into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hmm. God used Abel as his instrument to pull me back in. And um, I didn't sober up right away, but when I would relapse, you know, I put two weeks and then 10 days and I call up Abel and I'd be like, I, I, I did it again, man. You know, his answer was always the same. I still hear his voice exactly how he said, he'd be like, that's all right, man. Let's just let's go to a meeting tonight, you know. And he just he he just kept encouraging me. And in spite of myself, on June fifth of two thousand and thirteen, that's my sober day. You know, I just celebrated nine years a few weeks ago. And uh, good job, bro. <laughs> what a life, man! It's it's so much better this way. It's just we talk about lives that we couldn't even have imagined. It's a beautiful life, bro. I, I, you know, this this week I've I've done a lot of thinking about how I entered this space. I've been in healthcare a long time, since 1989. Yeah. You know, and uh, since what what year? 89, 1989. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was a, a young man at the time when I started studying respiratory and working in the respiratory department. But I I was just thinking the last few days about my life and how almost four years ago I came into the space of substance use disorder and mental health, right? And, you know, I have met so many wonderful people, including yourself, you know? Thank you. Um, Such just good people who, you know, I just feel really blessed to work in the industry that way, you know? And, and, And at first pitch, I fought it. What I mean by that is I, I kind of reluctant, reluctantly at that point in my life re-entered the workforce, but I knew I needed to because my business was not doing as well as I needed it to be doing. And I had talked to friends in AA, right, who had went on to become licensed drug and alcohol counselors and other therapists. And they would talk about, some of them would talk about outreach, right, which is like a marketing job, but it's a little more than that, right? Yeah. And um, so when I first started in the industry, you know, I, I knew that I could take what I'd done for 20 years of marketing, that I could apply that to pretty much anything, but that I needed to learn the industry, you know. And I was fortunate. My friends in AA started to introduce me to all kinds of people in, in our industry. And um, I struggled a bit with, you know, because recovery is so personal to us, right? It's very personal to me. Yes. You know, And so for me, those lines of you know what's really motivating me here in this moment am i really trying to help this man or woman and this family or am i feeling pressure because my numbers aren't that great for this month you know those are two very real thoughts and i did not like when those lines would start to kind of get skewed you know and so i i knew i was going to need a a way to reconcile those two things if i was going to stay and i found a couple of good brothers in recovery who had struggled with the same thing, we're, we're, we're good friends today, and they helped me with that. And they're like, you're right, Joe. You know, your program's not your job and your job's not your program, you know? And yet you do have to check your motives. You know? But someone does have to do this work 
someone does have to do it and you got to make a living right so just try and do it the best you can practice the principles in all your affairs joe that's right you know and so i learned to do that and now four years later you know i just i just feel incredibly blessed man i love i love our people man i love our people i love them in the rooms and i still love them in the rooms but now that i'm in this industry and i see that there's an army of us an army of us at all different levels trying to help other people just like us it blows my mind you know and uh if any of of the friends that I've made, and I've made a lot of them in the last four years are watching this, or if you end up watching it, just know that I love you. I love being a part of uh, you know, what we do together. And um, I'm very grateful, I'm very grateful. You know, you, you wear your, uh, your recovery on your sleeve in a very attractive way. And when I say that is this, it's interesting. When we get sober, many of us go down the 12 step route. So it's one thing to go into the 12 step community into the meetings and things like that, and just go to meetings. It's another to speak the lingo. It's another to actually do the work that it consists of and apply it to our lives so that we can become awakened and be more effective and overcome the addiction or the alcoholism or the both of them. Right now, sometimes I I will go to a 12 step meeting and hear people that have a lot of recovery time, time as far as sobriety, still talk about entertaining the thought of using or drinking or the thought still comes, or I, I thought about taking a drink or mm -hmm. I, or I, um, I was this close to taking a drink or on a birthday, perhaps it was the worst year of my life. And I actually thought about, taking a drink or using a drug. Now, when I hear that, I think to myself, have they not yet overcome addiction or alcoholism to the point where they're still thinking about doing the act? You know, a lot of us, when we use and drink for so many years and we get sober, we have using dreams mm -hmm. or drinking dreams. And they can come in different styles and forms like some of them might be where we are actually pursuing the drink or the drug during the dream and some of them are where we're actually doing the drug or the drink during the dream right some right. of us are are some of us have dreams where we realize during the dream like that's about to happen and wait a second here i'm supposed to be sober i'm not doing that and then some of us have the dream and we're actually just going after doing it and we do it and then we feel like this sense of remorse and guilt. Yeah. I almost don't even want to ask you, but I kind of do want to ask you, like, do you still entertain the thought of using or drinking? Um, no. Uh, but I'd be a liar if I didn't say that, you know, the thought doesn't come because, you know, I understand that, you know, I am sober today. I get a daily reprieve based on my spiritual condition. That's what I believe. Right. You know? And um, and uh, I don't ever want to get cocky or arrogant or prideful enough where I feel like, you know, you know, I, I have a healthy respect for it, right? Yeah. Um, and even a healthy fear of it because I know where it's going to take me. You know, I'm able to see that clearly now. Whereas back when I was really struggling, somehow I couldn't see what what was happening or what it was doing and you know, so to answer your question um, fully, um, I've the whole I have a daily reprieve uh, contingent on my spiritual uh, health or being right. There have been times in the last nine, year, nine years of my sobriety where I have been under some serious duress, you know, some very serious stress going through stuff with my ex wife regarding the kids, custody. I always wanted to share custody and. Even though I was practicing my program, during those times of extreme stress, the thoughts, the fleeting thoughts, they come more often, you know, and I would have drunk dreams, you know, and that told me very clearly that that monster still lives inside of me. This sure. is just me. I'm just speaking for me. No, I understand. I, I, at, at 15 years sober, I more recently 
still have had dreams where I'm actively using and realize in the middle of it, wait right. a second. Right. Am I, did I just lose everything or what? Like, okay, so I get yeah. that. So I fully understand that that's ingrained in me, you know, that, that. Well, you know, know, somebody, know somebody, somebody, said, that. somebody said this to me when I was early on in my recovery, due to the fact that it's so habitual for us when we use and drink and it becomes a daily occurrence to the point of a daily practice, a ritual, if you will, right? Yeah. A habit, oh, I love a my habit. Mm-hmm. Um, when we have using and drinking dreams in recovery, somebody, a counselor told me, I think it was a therapist, said, your brain is healing. Your brain is healing. So because oh. you're so used to doing that all of the time, during this time of healing, it's up to you to, to become conscious of your brain matter and what's going on inside of it and mm-hmm. how to, what you're doing on in the real world, you know, how you're really working on your recovery to the point where your dreams might start to, to change. So when the healing process is even, even happening, when it's healing during the time that you're dreaming, having the using dreams that you you've embraced your sobriety enough to where it matters to you, even in your dreams. <laughs> I like that. I like that even in your dreams. Right. So I the like point, that. that's why, like I get a lot of people that tell me, Pej, I had a using dream. I know they call it a freebie. I woke up this morning in a cold sweat. Mm-hmm. You know, I got, I, I woke up in a cold sweat and I'm so happy I woke up sober. I'm like, I'm happy you woke up and we're happy you woke up sober. Mm-hmm. Really. In a sense, right, we can right. we can view it instead of calling it a freebie, let's call it a nightmare that uh, yeah, exactly. doesn't need to come through. through. So, <laughs> right. Hi, Aaron. That's I see what it is to me, man. It's not a freebie. I don't want a freebie. I don't, I don't want, want a freebie. I don't, I don't want, want a freebie. Anything. You know, like I have no misgivings, man. You know, like, again, I'm not going to lie to you and say that every now and then I get a fleeting thought and I catch myself and I'm like, what are you thinking? You know what I mean? Right. You know? Another thing that matters to me about what you said, you said, I love the life I have right now and the people that I'm working with. Like, I, I get that. Like, And it's not just about people like that uh, we are trying to help uh, take through the process of the steps, for example. But it's like people that we interact with, people that we interact with in, in our professional setting. I know that. Um, during the pandemic, you and I both worked for a place, places where there was high expectations of us as those outreach types, those mm-hmm. people that were basically marketing for the centers that we worked for. We, we shared some frustrations of, you know, the expectations that were put upon the table that would create anxiety for us of what we, what our companies that we worked for wanted us, what kind of performance they wanted us to do. The whole, you know, let's go out and save lives and let's, you know, so raw, we, raw, raw. Mm-hmm. We, we, we branched off. I remember that you talked to me about um, you wanted to learn what I was doing as far as interventions. I told you who I was trained and uh, mm-hmm. supervised under. And oh, then um, and then you went on to be trained by Brad Lamb. And I know that you went through his intervention trainings and then you created a, a, a your own company, a business, if you will. Uh, the doing interventions out there in your respective areas. Uh, tell me about that a little bit, like your experience with interventions, how long you've been uh, doing them, and uh, and what, what kind of fulfillment do you get out of doing them? Sure. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, so I will tell you that what inspired me to, to, to do it was a couple of things, to get trained and become an interventionist. And the first thing was that, you know, I mentioned before that outreach is kind of a marketing job, but it's more than that. Right. It's more than that. And that what I discovered was that I was also interacting with the families and even with the possible potential client or patient themselves. Right. And trying to help them understand the disease of addiction um, and uh, understand their loved one a little bit better or even their own behaviors a little better. And um, I started to really enjoy that part of the outreach job, you know, much to the dismay of some of my managers, by the way, because they didn't want me spending so much time on that. Right. And understandable. We had a job to do. But anyway, that's what it okay, just kind of got the idea going within me. And then I met people like yourself, you especially because I, I got to be honest with you, bro. You really inspire me. You know, like you inspired me. You inspire me every day. But you are definitely a big uh, part of that. You know, the, the drive. But eventually kind of got me from thinking about it for almost a year or maybe a year to finally taking the action, you know, our conversations, you know, and um, 
So, yeah, so I, I trained, um, I, I put my company together, I called it Transcend Interventions, um, and, I, and I, I love the word transcend because it literally means to rise above, rise above your current circumstances and, and, and move beyond your current circumstances. And we can do that. Anybody can do that, you know. I always say there is help and there is hope. We can do that. So that's why I call it the Transcend Interventions. Um, everything that I that I put together from the marketing material to the website was meant to inspire, meant to give hope. Um, you know, when I started working with families in outreach and then started doing, you know, the formal interventions, um, I always say that I educate, I enlighten, and I empower. Or I should say it this way. I educate, they become enlightened, and they become empowered. Because that's what I see happening. And maybe, I, I'm sure you get what I'm saying. Yes, I you do. Start, you start to teach them about the disease of addiction. You start to show them that you understand their loved one and what drives them and why they behave the way that they do. You start to teach them about what they've been doing right, what maybe they're not doing so right, and what they could do better. And you start to watch the lights come on, you know? And that's why I use the word enlightened. And people become empowered when they know more, right? The more they know, the more empowered they become. And uh, yeah, so that's that's what I that's what I do now, and I love it. You know, I love it. Um, it's uh, it's very rewarding. I didn't realize how rewarding it was going to be until I actually started doing it formally. Um, you know, I, I go to Google and I read some of my reviews and to this day, they still choke me up because I didn't realize, I knew I was going to be helping the families as much um, as the person who needed to go into treatment. Um, and actually, sometimes when I read those reviews or when the families speak to me, I almost feel like I help them even more. You know? Everyone gets elevated, Tej. Everyone is in a new, you know, they're standing in a different place by the time we're done working with them, right, Pesh? Wouldn't you say that? Like, Absolutely. they're just not the same. You know, you take them through this process, they've learned, they've become enlightened, they're stronger, um, they know about setting boundaries, and they, again, doing it all with a lot of love, with a lot of purpose, but with a lot of love, and uh, they're just much better off for it. Yeah, I, you know, Without knowing, without seeing what you're doing out there, I already feel like you're doing great work. Um, just by like talking to you, the many times that we have personally, I just I know your heart. Definitely, I know your heart. So I I I, um, I know you're doing good work. I I personally, as an interventionist with helping and working with various people, um, there's so many people I interact with, so many scenarios, so many different families, so many different friends trying to help a friend or a loved one. Um, that it's always a different story and, and, and it's, this isn't for everybody. No. A lot of people, you, you can't get your emotions caught up in other people's stories. You, you know, you can't I'm still working there. on that part. Right. Yeah. Sitting, I mean, some might, but sitting in an intervention, I, I'm not, there's times when I got to hold back tears because I oh, will yeah. suddenly yeah. feel other people's, uh, familial turmoil or sadness mm. or anguish yeah. or pain. And so, you know, I, when I am, uh, when I'm doing this stuff, I have to be able to read the room. I have to be able to hold my composure and, uh, guide people through you. Sometimes people will guide themselves right through it and I won't have to say much. Right. right. But I am there to help navigate and make sure things don't fall off course. As an interventionist, my job is to help intervene. That's right. Yeah. I'm still working on the whole not getting my emotions caught up in things. I don't, I don't, I don't mean like while the intervention's happening. It's just that you really grow to love these families, Bez. You right. know, and you want to help them. You know, I, I can honestly say that uh, I try to pour myself into them, like give them all that I know, you know, and the, and all the support that I can. And um, yeah, you know, you just see them hurting and. Uh, you know, we're good human beings, I think, you know, so of course it's going to, it's going to touch us, you know, right. I just got to get better and not letting it uh, affect me too much, you know, but yeah, maybe not, 
maybe I'll just say stay the tender hearted guy that I am, that I like to think that I am. Continue. Be yourself. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, sometimes the language of the heart doesn't just need to be spoken within a 12 step arena, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. It can be spoken in any given time of our day. So, yeah, I mean, this has been a, a good episode. It's been good to have you on here. I've been wanting to have you on here for some time, <laughs> quite some time. Uh, yeah. As you were talking, I thought to myself, I got some friends out in Jersey I should connect you with. If they're near you, you plug them into some of the groups that you're in or that some of the groups that. Therein, I think good friendships could develop. Um, you're such a good man. You know, such a good man that it's so nice to see what you're doing, who you're helping. Uh, there's guys that are mine and, mine and your age that are still kind of, uh, they're not, they're like weekend warriors. Some of them like to take it a little bit farther. They're still partying like they're in their early 20s. They're having mm -hmm. heart, heart attacks. They're getting shot out. And they're wondering like why their lives aren't working for them and we can demonstrate what recovery really consists of and be there for them and be examples. And maybe we could be there, Abby Thatcher. Amen, brother. Amen. I agree 100%. Very much love you. And I keep on staying purple. You already know what I mean. <laughs> Rinse all the way. It's, I love really, you too, it's really funny. And I want to, I'll close with this. Let me say this real quick since we're Prince fans. Yes. For anybody please. that cares, right? Yeah. In in 2015, I had seven huge bins of Prince memorabilia, all different types of stuff, albums. I'm talking magazines, duplicates magazines that were in mint condition, plastic wrapped, mm -hmm. many different things that I had accumulated over the years. 2015. I thought to myself, you know what? I've already gone to this guy's house. He, I won a contest. He played for us in his living room for two amazing. and a half hours. That's so amazing. Uh -huh. I've been to concerts. I've interacted with him. We've talked a few times, even if it was just small that conversations. So crazy to me, man. All That's of my so dreams awesome. had come true, and I thought, I'm lugging around these big bins all the time. I'm just going to give it all away. So, wow. so I put it on my Facebook. All right, anybody and everybody – Purple family, if you're in Los Angeles, let me know. You have two hours to come down and pick through whatever I have. I'm, these people came like flies on shit. I'm telling you, it's like right. they, they came from all corners, and they came and just grabbed all of it up. I'm talking mm -hmm. like every last – there was stuff in there that was worth a lot during that time when Prince was still alive. Following mm -hmm. year, Prince passes away. So if I was to really go back and – through what I had, there was, I mean, I, I don't want to put a number on it, but I could have probably sold a lot of stuff because the value of it went up because he passed yeah, away. No doubt. Fast forward, one of my dearest friends, Rachel Reinhold, who we were fr Prince fans from a very young age. Like I'm talking like in our early twenties, right? She passed away from fent from a fentanyl overdose two years ago, and she's older too. Like I don't even I didn't know she was even messing with that. Actually, I did know later on. She told me, and I told her, "You got to get off of that shit. That shit'll kill you." And uh, sure enough, it got the best of her. Well, her daughter found me. Uh, she her daughter and I had already sometimes had conversations. She's actually sober too. She awesome. sent she sent me a message the other day on Facebook and showed me a picture of a box of all of her mom's memorabilia and said. We don't want to throw this out. Are you willing? I said, mail it to me. I'll pay for the post. <laughs> she sent it to me. And right before, while we were waiting before this this broadcast started, I went downstairs. I st I opened it up and I felt like I was looking at my old box of memorabilia because there was wow. like all the, all the, so it's like full circle. Things just shift and go in a, in a whole different direction. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like my friend Rachel basically just said, here you go. He's a little piece, little That's piece nice. of, the of the purple uh, yeah, magic, yeah. right? So, it, you know, you and I, we, we're like-minded. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Spar is writing, who's Prince? LOL, just kidding. <laughs> but, but you know, like when, when, you, when you bleed purple, yeah, you understand. Yeah. Yeah. Pesh, what was it like to, to have a conversation with him? Like, what was that like? It's I mean, really I'm a huge fan. I've been a fan since I was a teenager. I've seen him live. You never know what, you know, you never know what the right words are to say when you have like 
a quick right. conversation with them. Plus, there's bodyguards and stuff in the way, so you can't be genuine with them. I did right. go on national television on Arsenio and was asked to ask him a question, but it wasn't from me. It was from the producer, oh, which was okay. bullshit because it was a stupid question. <laughs> right. But right. regardless of the fact, like, um, you know, I mean, now now that I go back to Paisley Park and actually walk through and everything and and see like what you know his, his the empire that he created for himself um i see like what and then go around to the areas in minneapolis where he grew up and everything i i recognize his humanness and i just realized this kid was just talented from a very young age yes he was uh, learned instruments at a very young, young age like any other kid in america that could learn yeah. a bunch of instruments but he just took it next level and then next level and then next level to the point where he was recognized for being the most the most talented musician ever. I don't never. care what anybody says, Me ever. Either. You Me can't either. touch him. Never. I'm talking like yeah. a modern day Mozart or Amadeus and then you know 100%. as far as guitar playing, people people can uh, discuss it all day long, but this guy could play outplay anybody, right? So and, and people will laugh, you know, a lot of people actually that aren't Prince fans laugh at me. They don't get it. They don't get it. They, they, <laughs> they laugh at it. me for the way that I love Prince. They think I'm a fanboy. In reality, I am a fucking fanboy. Like Prince was the best. Like yeah. if you, if he was still alive, I would still be able to take friends and say, you don't get it. Let me take you to a concert. Yes. So you, so you understand. Yeah. And then yeah. afterwards they just walk away from it. Like, Oh my God, you were right. Just like yeah. we could in, in 2011 and 2012 and all the times before he passed away. So yeah. I mean, it was good to have I, I meant to talk about some of this with you too on this podcast because mm -hmm. I think like that's kind of how we met. Like between oh, our it professional world created and, and our purple an world. connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Kindred spirits, buddy. Kindred yeah. spirits all the way. Well, have a beautiful rest of your day. Enjoy yeah. uh enjoy yourself. Uh I'll be in touch and communication with you. I love you very much. Have a good day. Love you, brother. Take care. Peace, brother. Bye. Bye.